Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our service here at Online Bible Church. We are so glad that you've joined us today. Now, um, a couple of announcements that I'd like to make. Um, again, Bible study this Wednesday night. I actually filmed uh, Wednesday's Bible study. I just finished filming it about 10 minutes ago, and so I just came in right under the nose. And I'm going to apologize up front because it's going to be a little longer than normal. Um, for Bible studies, I try to keep it between 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes tops. But this week, when I ended the recording, I noticed it said 28 minutes. And so I really wanted to finish up Romans chapter 7 uh, for this week. And so it's going to be slightly longer than our normal Bible studies. But uh, once you get on a roll, sometimes you don't want to quit until you're finished. And so... Um, praise the Lord, we did uh, get that finished, so you can look forward to that. Uh, we'll have it uploaded by Wednesday at 6 p.m. Another thing that I want to mention, another announcement is, uh, I've been thinking for the last couple of weeks about wanting to take a two-week vacation. And these uh, two weeks will not be one right after the other. I'm probably going to take one week uh, towards the beginning of summer and one week probably towards the end of summer. And so for those weeks, um, there will be no service or Bible study, and that's going to happen. I haven't decided when, but the first week is probably going to be um, towards the beginning of summer, and the second week is probably going to be towards the end of summer. It's probably going to... Uh, I'm going to try and see if it co coincides with when my wife's surgery is anticipated to be. And so... I wanted to let you know up front that there will be um, twice during the summer uh, a full week with no service or Bible study. And so um, with any, without any further ado, we're going to get into worshiping the Lord um, this afternoon. And the hymn that I picked out for us to sing is Springs of Living Water. We've sung this before, but I believe it's been a while. And so let's sing it again. The Springs of Living Water. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Oh, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Be now am I, my soul may satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Oh, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul may satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. O oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. O oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Oh, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sir, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Oh, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. 
Oh, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Praise the Lord, are you drinking at the springs of living water? Well, you will never thirst again. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let the temple be filled with his glory. Oh, let the courts be filled with his praise. Oh, let us worship the Lord in the holy of holies. Zion rejoices again. Oh, let the temple be filled with his glory. Oh, let the courts be filled with his praise. Oh, let us worship the Lord in the holy of holies. I am rejoices again. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. Well, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Oh, in the city of our God, oh, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, I'll never forget that wonderful hour when I felt His power and I prayed through. All heaven came down and God's glory abounded. The angels resounded when I prayed through. Well, I'll never forget that wonderful hour when I felt His power and I prayed through. abounded, the angels resounded, when I prayed through. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's sing one more chorus, and this is an old Gold City song. We're going to sing the chorus. It's called Ain't God Good. And I know that's not uh, great grammar, but ain't God good. Praise the Lord. Well, ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving. 
that's what we are. We ought to thank Him. We'll love and praise Him a little more today and a whole lot more tomorrow. Well, ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving? That's what we are. We ought to thank Him. We'll love and praise Him a little more today and a whole lot more tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, we are going to pray this afternoon, just as we do every week at this time, and we're going to pray for Grandma Elaine again. She had her biopsy on Thursday, and from what I understand, she's doing well, but we're just waiting for the results to come back. And so we're going to pray for her. We're also going to pray for my wife, Samantha. Um, she has to do a Holter monitor this week. And she has to put that on for 48 hours, and I believe she goes on Tuesday to have that done. And she also has an appointment um, with her surgeon to give consent for the surgery that she's going to have. And so we are going to pray for her that everything will work out and that there will be no complications. And so we're just going to pray for these two needs. Again, if you have your own needs, don't be afraid to approach the throne of grace. God wants you to cast your cares upon him, for he careth for us. And so we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have the ability to come together here on Facebook Live and on YouTube. The privilege that we have to be able to study your word and learn your word, Lord, and we're so thankful that you care about what we care about, Lord, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and cast our cares upon you, for you care for us. We want to lift up my grandmother, Elaine. I want to pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that um, she will heal up from this uh, biopsy that she had, Lord. The results will come back. They will be promising that there will be a good prognosis, that uh, this tumor will be benign, and that it will no longer grow, Lord, but it will actually shrink, Lord. We want to pray for this. And I want to pray, Lord, that you'll be with her in the moments that she's alone, Lord, and maybe needs some encouragement. We pray, God, that you'll be with her in those, those moments and in those hours. We pray, Lord, that you'll uh, reach out and hold her, Lord, and, and comfort her and strengthen her through all of this in Jesus' name. I want to pray again for Samantha, my wife. I want to pray, Lord, for this halter monitor that she needs to wear for 48 hours. I pray, God, that the results that they get from that, again, will, will be good and, and that there will be no cause for concern. I want to pray for the surgery that she's having. We don't know when it is yet, but we believe it's getting closer probably this summer. And so I want to pray, Lord, that you'll be with her that you'll guide the doctor and the surgeon's hands, that you'll protect her um, from any uh, harm, that you'll protect her from any complications or infections or anything that might cause um, some concern. We just want to pray, Lord, that the surgery will go well, that there will be no problems, that she will recover, and that everything will work out well for, and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to pray, Lord, for the remainder of this service. I want to pray as I preach this message that uh, I've prepared and that you have helped me, Lord, that, uh, that you'll give me a voice to be able to proclaim this truth with boldness, Lord, and conviction. And I want to pray, Lord, that somebody that's watching this video will need to hear the truth that you will have me present today. I want to pray, Lord, your blessing upon this service, that the word that I speak will not be my word, but your word, Father, and we ask this. In the precious name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So we started a couple weeks ago a sermon series. And it's called Look Up Child. And the first uh, message in that series was about the rapture. And about what's going to happen uh, when we get, uh, when Jesus Christ returns and we get to go with him. The second uh, sermon that I preached, and this was last week, was on the glorified body and what's going to happen to our bodies 
How we're going to turn from corruptible to incorruptible. How we're going to have a body that's going to be like Jesus' body. It's going to be a spiritual body. It's going to be a glorified body. And so today, I want to continue this message and I want to talk about the tribulation period. The tribulation period is going to be a very fearful time for anybody that has to endure it. But I'm thankful today that the church of Jesus Christ, that we are a part of, the body of Christ, is going to be raptured out before the tribulation comes to pass. And so we don't need to really worry about what's going to happen during the tribulation period. Uh, but I believe it's important to understand what's going to happen for the people that are left behind. And if you are saved today by the blood of Jesus Christ, you'll not have to worry about the tribulation. You'll not have to worry about this terrible time. And if you're watching this video and you're not saved, and you haven't trusted in the gospel, you haven't trusted, excuse me, in the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm hoping that this message today of what's going to happen to you and to the world after the church is gone, I'm hoping this will give you a little bit of a nudge on the importance of getting saved right now and not put it off. I mentioned last week about a little uh, proverb that I heard about a man that kept pushing off his salvation. He kept saying, oh, I'm going to get saved at the 11th hour. But he died at 10.30. And so he missed it. So we're going to talk about the tribulation. And of course the tribulation is going to happen after the church is already raptured. So we're not going to be around for this. The church and the Christians and the body of Christ are not going to be here for the tribulation period. So we're going to get to escape these terrible things. But if you're watching this video and you are not saved and the rapture happens, you're going to be left behind. And I'm going to show you what a terrible time you're going to have on this earth after the church is gone. And our text is going to be in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter. And bear with me because I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's not a long chapter, it's only 18 verses. But again, it's quite a lengthy passage of scripture, and so bear with me as I read it to you. Revelation chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his ten horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads the name, of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw on one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, and blasphemed his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear he leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth, 
in the sight of men. And it seemeth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that so many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. That's a pretty lengthy passage of scripture, but it talks about the beast. And the beast is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be a leader. The Antichrist is going to be somebody that comes up out of the government. And he's going to be the leader of the entire world. Why are we as Christians so fearful of the New World Order? It's because the New World Order, the Antichrist, is going to be the head of it. I don't know what this New World Order is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be the United Nations. I don't know if it's going to be the Roman Catholic Church. I don't know if it's going to be the European Union. I don't know if it's going to be the United States of America. I don't know if it's going to be China. I have no idea. But one thing I do know is that the entire world is going to embrace this Antichrist. So let's go back and dissect this passage of Scripture a little bit. Let's go all the way back to verse 1. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, And I stood upon the stand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Well, this is not talking about somebody standing on the seashore and seeing a physical monster come up. This is talking symbolically and allegorically about the sea, which is, of course, the sea of turmoil and revolution. The world of politics. And out of this world of politics, there's going to be a beast that's going to come up out of it. And it has seven heads, seven heads and ten horns. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at this ten horns. What does that mean? The ten horns are going to be kings. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. That's going to tell us this. Revelation chapter 17. And I want to read verses 12 and 13. Re Revelation 17, verses 12 and 13. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as to kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And so for some reason, somehow, ten kingdoms are going to come together and form this Antichrist union. And the nations of the world are going to come together and they're going to worship the image of this beast. Now there are some things that I have heard and I've heard about who could be the Antichrist. And you can go on YouTube and on Google and look it all up and keep yourself busy the rest of your life on who the possibility of the Antichrist is going to be. There was quite a, a thinking back in 2008 that that Antichrist might actually be Barack Obama. It turned out that it wasn't. I listened to some compelling evidence, and I'm not saying this is true, but it is possible that the Antichrist is going to be Prince Charles. It may very well be. And I know my wife, she loves the royals, and, and she's right into watching documentaries on the royals, and she might not like this, but really it's possible. And I'm not saying Prince Charles is the Antichrist, that when Queen Elizabeth passes away and Charles becomes King Charles, that's going to be the Antichrist. I'm not saying that dogmatically because I don't know. I'm just saying this is a possibility. 
Because if you think about it, how many nations are in or controlled by the British monarchy? Um, the last I checked was 14. Well, this verse in, in Revelation 17, verses 12 to 13, say 10 kingdoms. Could it be? Could it not be? I don't know. I'm not saying it dogmatically. I'm not saying Prince Charles is the Antichrist. I'm not saying Joe Biden is the Antichrist. I'm not saying the Pope is the Antichrist. Well, the Pope is leading an Antichrist system. But the Pope may not be the actual Antichrist. We don't know who the Antichrist is because he's not been revealed yet. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 13 and let's continue uh, looking at this passage. Let's go to verse 2 when it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the feet as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Well, that's talking about the dragon. Who is this dragon that gives him his seat and his authority? Well, this dragon is Satan. And so the Antichrist is going to be possessed with the spirit of the devil. This Antichrist is going to reign with the power of the devil behind him. And because the church is going to be gone, there's not going to be any Christians left. There's going to be no resistance to that devil. There's going to be no resistance to that Antichrist. There's going to be no warnings about it. You're not going to have preachers on YouTube and, and on Facebook Live like me telling you what's evil and what's, what's wrong and corrupt. And you're not going to be able to, to hear about Bible prophecy because the church is going to be raptured. And so we're not going to be here to warn you, beware of this guy, he's possibly the Antichrist. So a lot of people are going to fall for it. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. This is quite interesting. Did you know that the Antichrist is going to be killed? And this Antichrist is going to be assassinated, but he's going to come back to life. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to worship him, because they're going to see, wow, he died and he came back to life. He died and he resurrected, just like Jesus did. This guy has to be true. This guy has to be uh, a God. And, and you'll notice in this passage where it talks about the names of blasphemy and about how blasphemy comes out of this man's mouth is because he's going to claim that he is God. And he's going to die and he's going to resurrect. And there was a prophecy written way back in the Old Testament over 700 years, I believe, over 400 years anyway, before Jesus Christ was even born, that talked about this deadly wound and how this Antichrist is going to come back to life. And let's go to the book of Zechariah, back in the Old Testament. Towards the end of the Old Testament, there's a book called Zechariah. And let's go back there. Zechariah. I can find it here. Zechariah, chapter 11, verses 17. Zechariah 11 and verse 17. And keep in mind, this was written many hundred years before Jesus was even born. Zechariah 11, verse 17. Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up. His right eye shall be utterly darkened. He's going to have something wrong with one of his arms, this Antichrist. And he's going to be blind in one eye. Let's go to verse 5. Another prophecy of this Antichrist. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So he's going to speak great blasphemies. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to be claimed to be God incarnate, but really he's only Satan incarnate. And so there's going to be a lot of people that are going to worship him because they're going to see what's happened to him. He's going to perform miracles. He's going to perform signs and wonders. And he's going to deceive many people. And many people are going to worship him as a God because they're going to believe that he is God. 
Now also notice in verse 5 it says, continue 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. And we're not going to get into it today, but the, rebel, the, the tribulation period is seven years. And it goes back to a prophecy in the book of Daniel, where there's going to be a seven year period that was left over. And that prophecy, and, the, and so that's where we get the seven-year tribulation. We don't have time to get into that today. That's a study for another day. But we know that the, the tribulation period is going to be divided up into two, uh, two times of three and a half years and three and a half years. There's going to be three and a half years of tribulation when the Antichrist is, is um, in power. Then there's going to be three and a half years of great tribulation where that... Um, Antichrist is going to be Satan incarnate, incarnate. He's going to die. He's going to come back. And he's going to have the whole spirit of Satan within him. Not only that, but that God's wrath is going to be poured out upon the earth. And we're going to get to that later. Verse 6. And he opened the, his mouth to blaspheme against God and to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. And them that dwell in heaven. So he's going to continue to blaspheme God. He's going to say he is God. If you remember uh, the theology that goes back to how Satan became who he is, he wasn't always Satan. God did not create Satan as a devil. God created Lucifer, who was a very high-ranking cherub. He wasn't just an angel. He was a cherub. The cherubim, the seraphim, and the angels. And what, got, what caused Lucifer to fall? Pride. He wanted to be God. We're not going to go to the passage in Isaiah, but there is a passage in Isaiah that says, I will, Satan's saying, I will, I will, I will, I will be like the Most High. So God cut him off, sent him out of heaven, and he took one third of the angels with him. And so this tabernacle that we're talking about in verse 6 is the temple in Jerusalem. Let's look at verse 10. And he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. There is the patience and the faith of the saints. He's going to be killed with a sword. He's going to be killed with a sword. This Antichrist is going to die. He's going to be assassinated. And he's going to come back to life. That's going to happen about halfway through the tribulation period. And people look at this verse and they say, look, the saints, the saints. Does that mean the church? No, the church is gone. The saints here that it's talking about in verse 10 are the saints, the tribulation saints that are martyred for Christ. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, you're going to get quite confused at this. Because Catholics teach that in order to be a saint, you have to be, you have, you have to have, Perform miracles, you have to have been dead for a number of years, and you have to be declared a saint by the Pope. And that is not true. That is not biblical theology. Again, that is something else that Catholics get wrong. A saint is a saved believer. A saint is anybody who is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a saint. My wife's a saint. If you're watching this video and you're saved, you're a saint. But there's going to be people that are going to get saved during the tribulation period. Those tribulation saints, those Jews with, that God is going to go back to deal with, that do happen to get saved during the tribulation period, those are going to be the tribulation saints. And that's the saints it's talking about here in verse 10. Let's look at verses 11 and 13. 11 and 13, And behold, another beast coming up out of the earth, and that he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake, as a dragon. Verse 12, And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. So this is talking about the Antichrist after he dies. He's going to come back. This other beast that's coming up out of the earth, that's this. And not only is he just going to be possessed by the spirit of the devil, and the power of the devil is going to be behind his kingdom, he is going to be full Satan incarnate. And he's going to be ruthless. So what's going to happen? 
Verse 14, and, dece and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So this Antichrist is going to be assassinated by a sword. We looked at the passage in Zechariah 11 and it talked about his wounded arm and his eye. That's going to be blinded. How is that going to happen? By a sword. That's what this says. Let's look at verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So anybody that's living during the tribulation period, that refuses to take the mark of the beast, is going to be beheaded. Let's go to Revelation 20 and verse 4. Revelation 20 and verse 4. It says this, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them, that I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and that they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So if you are living in the tribulation period and you take and you do not take the mark of the beast, you refuse the mark of the beast, you're going to be killed and beheaded. You're going to be martyred. Well, then I'll take the mark of the beast, and you're going to be damned forever. Revelation 19 and verse 20. Revelation 19 and verse 20 says this, And the beast was taken, and with the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, those were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to be damned forever. You're going to go with Satan and the Antichrist. You're going to go to hell and burn in the lake of fire for all eternity. If you refuse the mark of the beast, you're going to lose your life here on earth. But you're going to get to be in heaven and rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So you're going to have a choice to make. If you miss the rapture and you're left behind, you have a choice to make about the mark of the beast. Either you take it and you're damned forever and go to hell and burn for all eternity in the lake of fire, or you're going to refuse that mark and you're going to be beheaded. But you're going to get to be with Jesus. You're going to get to go to heaven and be in the millennial kingdom. So you're going to have a choice to make. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 13. Let's look at verse 15. We already read verse 15. Let's go to verse 16. Verse 16. And he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This is why one of the reasons why you need a King James Bible. If you have any other version than the King James, you will say it is a, it will say it is a mark printed on. It is not a mark printed on. It is a mark in the right hand or in the forehead. It is very likely that this mark of the beast will be a microchip. It is going to somehow be tied to finances. How do we know that? Let's keep reading. Verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And so, you're not going to be able to buy anything, you're not going to be able to sell anything, if you refuse this mark. So not only if you refuse the mark, are you going to be beheaded, but you're not going to be able to buy or sell anything. So you're not going to be able to buy or sell anything, and that, so you're going to starve. You're going to starve. And then eventually when they do catch up to you and find out, hey, you don't have the mark. No, I'm not going to get the mark. Off with your head. So it's going to be a lose-lose situation here. Verse 20, uh, sorry, Verse 18, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred and threescore 
and 6. What is that? 600 and 3 score. Well, a score is 20, and there's 3 score. So 2, 4, 6. So 660 and 6. 6, 6, 6. You've probably heard that. It's all over popular media. Maybe you've seen the movie The Omen. Talked about the Antichrist being alive as a little boy. And there was a dramatic scene where the father goes in and he needed proof. Before he killed his son, he needed proof that this was the Antichrist. And he went in and he, he started shaving the head off this kid's scalp. And found 666. Six, six. It's quite a dramatic movie. Not exactly uh, theologically correct, but still interesting nonetheless. So we know... That if you, take, if you do not take the mark, you are not going to be able to buy anything or sell anything. We know that the mark, everybody's going to have to take. Everybody. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. That's everybody. Everybody. You have to take the mark. Well, what if you don't take the mark? Well, then you starve. You can't eat unless you go out and... Get your own food. Can't eat. Can't sell anything. You're going to be poor. You're going to be uh, feral living out in the woods. You're going to have to. And when they do catch up with you, and they notice, hey, you don't have the mark of the beast. Well, off with your head if you refuse it. That's something you're going to have to deal with if you're not saved and you're living in the tribulation. But if you do take the mark of the beast, you're going to be damned forever. We read in Revelation 19 and 20 that you're going to be cast into the lake of fire with the devil himself. So you're going to be damned forever. You either take the mark of the beast and, and uh, be damned forever, or don't take the mark of the beast, be killed physically, and then live with Jesus Christ. Not only that, but we're going to go to Revelation 16. What time are we at? Oh, I better hurry this up. We're going to look quickly at the plagues. So not only are you going to have to deal with the mark of the beast and the Antichrist and this ruthless dictator, you're going to have to deal with the wrath that God's going to pour out on the earth. And um, let's look at the first plague, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there was a, and fell a noisome, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped the image. And so that mark of the beast that's going to be in your right hand or in your forehead, there's going to be some type of a sore or an infection that's going to be tied into that. So you're going to have an infection if you take the mark of the beast. You're going to be sore. Uh, the second plague, uh, verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of dead men, and every living soul died in the sea. So everything in the sea is going to die. All the life in the sea is going to die, and the sea is going to turn to blood. Third plague. Verse 4, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. So the life in, this, in, the, in the fresh water is going to die, and the fresh water is going to turn to blood. You're not going to have anything to drink. The water is going to be undrinkable. The water is going, you're going to, you're going to die of thirst. Verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto them to scorch men with fire. So you're, you're probably going to see a solar flare. It's going to scorch you. It's going to be so unbearably hot. And verse 9, And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So I've heard estimates that a third of the trees on planet Earth are going to burn up and die. So you're not going to be able to drink anything. You're not going to be able to build a house or anything, because there's not going to be any wood. And because trees die, you're not going to have much oxygen anymore. You're not going to have much food because uh, all your sea life and all your, your freshwater life, all your fish are dead. Uh, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. 
and they gnaw their tongues for pain. So remember that sore that you've got? Uh, because of the first plague when you took the mark of the beast, well, it's going to be so sore and it's going to be so um, filled with agony that you're practically going to gnaw your tongue off because the pain is going to be so great. Not only that, but there's going to be darkness. So there's going to be a solar flare that's going to scorch a lot of stuff uh, here on the earth and there's going to be darkness. Verse 12, the sixth plague. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. That way of the kings and the east might be prepared. So the river Euphrates, which is a great river over in the Middle East, over near Jerusalem. In fact, if you go back to Genesis and look at the Garden of Eden, you'll notice that one of the, one of the borders of that uh, garden was the Euphrates River. So the Euphrates River is very significant to the desert. And so it's going to dry up. You're not going to have water. You're not going to be able to drink anything. And the seventh plague, let's go to verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of, of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, as such was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. The worst earthquake ever is going to shake the earth. So what's, what's the tribulation going to be like? Well, you're going to have a dictator who's going to force you to take the mark of the beast and damn your soul forever. And if you refuse it, you're going to starve to death and, and um, you're going to be beheaded. And that's not tying just the, just the Antichrist. When God starts pouring out his wrath upon the earth during the last part of the tribulation, uh, you're going to be so sore, you're going to have such a bad infection from the mark of the beast that the pain is going to be so great you're going to gnaw your tongue off. Uh, the sea life is going to die, and the sea is going to turn to blood. The freshwater life is going to die. The freshwater is going to turn to blood. The scum is going to scorch you, and scorch probably a third of the trees on the planet. So you're not going to be able to breathe properly because there's a lack of oxygen. You're not going to be able to eat anything. You're not going to be able to drink anything. Um, there's going to be utter darkness upon the earth, the Euphrates River is going to dry up, so the desert is going to be even worse, you're not going to have anything to drink, and then to top it all off, you're going to have the world's biggest earthquake. That's what's in store for you, if you're watching this video today, you're not saved, and the rapture happens. You're going to be left behind, and you're going to have to deal with all of that stuff. There is a way out. There is a way to escape that, and that is to get saved today. I want to go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so I want to share with you the gospel. So if you're watching this video and you do not want to go through this tribulation, I'm going to show you right now how to get out of it and how to go at the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, wherein ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, verse... Uh, 3 says how that Christ died. How did Christ die? Christ died by shedding his blood. If you trust in that blood and you trust in the death, the burial, and the resurrection for your sins, your sins are going to be washed away by the blood of Christ. If you trust in that gospel, you are going to be saved. And everything that I just told you today about what's going to happen in the tribulation period, you're not going to have to worry about because you're going to be in heaven. choice is yours. The choice is yours. You can keep living the way you are and not believe and have to go through all of that terrible stuff. Or you can get saved right now and get right with God. And when the rapture happens, you get to go and escape all of that torment. The choice is yours. 
So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful once again for the words that you have given us today. I want to pray right now for Grandma. I want to pray, Lord, that you'll continue to be with her, Lord, that um, as they uh, do tests on this tissue that they biopsied from her brain, we pray, God, that, that it will come back um, uh, negative for cancer, it will be benign, that there will be no uh, complications, and that it will not grow, but in fact will shrink in Jesus' name. We want to pray healing for her, Lord. I want to pray again for my wife, Samantha. I want to pray, Lord, that as she wears this halter monitor and they look at the results of that, they see that there's nothing wrong, there's no heart murmur, there's no problems there, there's going to be nothing more that's going to hold up this surgery. Um, and we pray, God, that when the surgery does happen, that you will guide that surgeon's hand, that you will keep her safe from any uh, infection, that you will keep her safe from any uh, a complication, Lord, and that you will recover and do well and, and recover as expected. In Jesus' name, we pray for her. I want to pray, Lord, for everybody that's watching this video. I want to pray, Lord, that if there's somebody watching this video that is not right with you, Lord, and they're not saved. I pray, Lord, that this message today about what's going to happen after the church leaves, what they're going to have to deal with and what they're going to experience, I pray, will give them that nudge that they need to get right with you and get saved. So, Lord, I just want to pray that you'll be with us this week. I want to pray, God, that uh, as we go about our week, you will be with us, Lord, and that we can all come back again next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So um, we are very over time, so I'm not going to, uh, I was going to sing a little chorus again, but we're not going to do that for the sake of time. And so until next week, God bless.